Judges chapter 17. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have had, I have that silver with me, I took it. Then his mother said, the Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make an image overlaid with silver. I will give it back to you. So after he returned the silver to his mother, she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who used them to make the idol. And it was put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine and he, had, he made an ephod and some household gods and installed one of his sons as his priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, he said and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, live with me and be my father and priest and I'll give you 10 shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him and the young man became like one of his sons to him. Then Micah installed the Levite and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. And Micah said, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since this Levite has become my priest. Chapter 18. In those days, Israel had no king. And in those days, the tribe of the Danites was seeking a place of their own where they might settle because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. So the Danites sent five of their leading men from Zorah and Eshtael to spy out the land and explore it. These men represented all the Danites. They told them, go explore the land. So they entered the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah where they spent the night. When they were near Micah's house, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. So they turned in there and asked him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them what Micah had done for him and said, he has hired me and I am his priest. Then they said to him, please inquire of God to learn whether our journey will be successful. The priest answered them, go in peace, your journey has the Lord's approval. So the five men left and came to Laish, where they saw that the people were living in safety like the Sidonians, at peace and secure. And since their land lacked nothing, they were prosperous. Also, they lived a long way from the Sidonians and had no relationship with anyone else. When they returned to Zorah and Eshtael, their fellow Danites asked them, how did you find things? They answered, come on, let's attack them. We have seen the land and it is very good. Aren't you going to do something? Don't hesitate to go there and take it over. When you get there, you will find an unsuspecting people and a spacious land that God has put into your hands, a land that lacks nothing whatever. The 600 men of the Danites armed for battle set out from Zorah and Eshtael. On their way, they set up camp near kiriath Jerem in Judah. This is why the place west of kiriath Jerem is called Mahanadan to this day. From there, they went on to the hill country of Ephraim and came to Micah's house. Then the five men who had spied out the land of Laish said to their fellow Danites, do you know that one of those houses has an ephod, some household gods and an image overlaid with silver? Now you know what to do. So they turned in there and went to the house of the young Levite at Micah's place and greeted him. The 600 Danites armed for battle stood at the entrance of the gate. The five men who had spied out the land went inside and took the idol, the ephod and the household gods while the priest and the 600 armed men stood at the entrance of the gate. When the five men went into Micah's house and took the idol, the ephod and the household gods, the priest said to them, what are you doing? They answered him, be quiet, don't say a word. Come with us and be our father and priest. Isn't it better that you serve a tribe and clan in Israel as priest rather than just one man's household? The priest was very pleased. He took the ephod 
the household goods and the idle and went along with the people, putting their little children, their livestock and their possessions in front of them, they turned away and left. When they had gone some distance from Micah's house, the men who lived near Micah were called together to over and overtook the Danites. As they shouted after them, the Danites turned and said to Micah, what's the matter with you that you called out your men to fight? He replied, you took the gods I made, my priest, and went away. What else do I have? How can you ask what's the matter with you? The Danites answered, don't argue with us, or some of the men may get angry and attack you, and you and your family will lose your lives. So the Danites went their way, and Micah, seeing that they were too strong for him, turned around and went back home. Then they took what Micah had made and his priest and went on to Laish against a people at peace and secure. They attacked them with the sword and burned down their city. There was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with anyone else. The city was in the valley near Beth Rehob. The Danites rebuilt the city and settled there. They named it Dan after their ancestor Dan, who was born to Israel, though the city used to be called Laish. There the Danites set up for themselves the idol and Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. They continued to use the idol Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. So far the reading. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, appreciate you reading those verses for us. Uh, keep your Bibles open. I, I don't know if you read this passage during the week in preparation. I hope you did. Uh, even as you were just listening to it then, um, what struck me as I read this on Monday, getting ready for today, that this is just a really weird passage. <laughs> just nothing seems to make sense. It's all so bizarre and strange. Uh, so probably you've got a lot of questions about what's going on here. Um, hopefully we'll answer some of those now. If not, we are going to have a question time after the sermon. So write down any questions, uh, keep track of them, and you'll have an opportunity to ask them of me afterwards. Uh, and hopefully that will be useful to you. For the kids, uh, those who are listening into the sermon, I've got something, uh, a few things for you to listen out to this morning. It's really simple. Uh, three things that I want you to listen out for. Two dangers and one hope. So listen carefully, two dangers and one hope. I want to see if you can pick out what those things are from the sermon as we go along. Don't forget kids, if you have any questions as well, uh, you can ask them. Really love to hear what you guys are thinking about this passage and about this sermon. So feel free to write in your questions after the sermon and I'd love to answer them as well. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna jump into this passage. So let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word. Uh, it is such a precious gift to have this amazing book which tells us all about you, tells us how you work in this world and, and how good and powerful and gracious you are. Father, sometimes it's got parts that are strange or hard to understand, such as this story before us today. And so we ask for your special help this morning uh, to help us understand it to help us to wrestle with this passage well and grasp what it is that you're saying to us. We thank you so much that you've given us your spirit who lives in us and who causes your words to speak to us. And we pray for his work amongst us this morning, that he might put aside distractions, that he might help us to listen and think and be open to your word and humble to receive it. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you've ever driven through Perth, you'll know uh, that in Perth there is that house. Uh, if you're heading south from Launceston going through Perth, not on the new bypass, it's on your, uh, on your right actually, just at the start of town. It used to be just a regular house, uh, but then the guy who owns it got into his head that uh, he would build himself a short fat windmill. Uh, you've probably seen it. Strange, but you know, it's, it's Perth after all. But then all of a sudden, his kind of ordinary normal house gradually started morphing into this castle. 
Uh, now it's got towers, now it's got ramparts, it's got flags and it's got knights in armour. Uh, you can't miss it. it it's, it's, it's Perth. I mean, it's totally bizarre. You might not think it's very tasteful, but <laughs> it's, it's his right to do it, isn't it? He can do with his house as he pleases, of course, within building regulations, but it's perfectly legal. Um, as as Daryl Kerrigan said, a man's house is his castle. Uh, and this bloke's taken it very literally indeed, hasn't he? But we like that right, don't we? We like the right to do as we please, uh, in our place, have our own way. That, that's good to us. Um, a British Prime Minister said it once, uh, a long time ago, in the 1700s, he said this, he said, the poorest man may in his cottage bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. It may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storm may enter, the rain may enter, but the King of England cannot enter. A man's house is his castle. Uh, it's autonomy. In my place, my ways. The right to do as I please. In my life, my ways. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It almost sounds good, doesn't it? Until you realise that it's the motto of these last chapters in Judges and it is not a positive thing at all. It's a terrible condemnation of the people. Does it work? Well, our passage today says no. <laughs> it really doesn't work. Next week, we're going to see it ends in utter moral disaster. Today, we're going to see it ends in complete religious chaos. It is dangerous to just do your own thing when it comes to God. It doesn't work. And today, we're going to see how and why that is. We're also going to see what God does about it as we open up these chapters. Now, you might have noticed we've left the judges per se behind. Uh, the focus in these last few chapters is really like an extended conclusion to this book. We're not looking at the characters of the judges. We're looking now at ordinary Israel. What, what's happening on the ground throughout the time of the judges? The, this story is like a snapshot of the nation. And in that snapshot, we meet Micah and his mum. Look again with me at verses 1 to 3 of chapter 17. Now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter a curse, I have that silver with me. I took it. Then his mother said, the Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord. I'm just going to pause right there. Because to this point, on the face of it, 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 it sounds kind of good, doesn't it? We've got this guy called Micah. His name means, uh, who is like Yahweh? You know, that's a really faithful, great Israelite name. Uh, look, what, look what happens. His mother uh, calls Yahweh, not just God in, in the general, but Yahweh, the specific covenant name of God, to bless. Uh, she talks about consecrating, that is dedicating her silver to Yahweh. It's, it's really good stuff. But it's just a little off, isn't it? I mean, firstly, we have this disagreement between mother and son. He stole 1,100 shekels of silver from her. That's, you know, a huge sum of money. It's 13 kilos of silver, you know, millions of dollars worth. And you see, when he returns it, he, he doesn't return it because he's repentant and sorry. He returns it because he hears her utter this curse. And he's scared. And do you see what she does? She just seems to forgive him. There's, there's no consequence here at all. And it gets more bizarre. For all their talk of Yahweh, they don't follow it up. Look at the second half of verse 3 through to verse 5. She says, I solemnly consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a cast idol. I will give it back to you. So he returned the silver to his mother and she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who made them into the image and the idol and they were put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine 
and he made an ephod and some idols and installed one of his sons as his priest. <laughs> Dedicate the money to God. That's good, absolutely. For a carved image? That's bad. That's not right at all. That's not how God works. Uh, remember what he says in Deuteronomy 12. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. It's not how God works. Let alone the fact that she dedicates 1,100 pieces of silver to God, but only ends up paying 200. You know, that's, that's a pretty creative accounting going on there. And now Micah has a shrine, literally a house of gods. He has an ephod that's a place to ask uh, or a means to ask for God's guidance or the God's guidance. And he even goes so far as to ordain one of his sons to be his priest. It's, it's totally bonkers. It doesn't make sense. It's about the least Israelite thing you could ever do. And it's no wonder then the conclusion. Look at verse 6. It's a really important verse. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. See, the whole story reads weird, doesn't it? It's, it's chaotic. There's right things and wrong things. They're close, but yet so far away. Uh, it reminds me a bit of shopping in Bali. Um, you know, we're on the beach one morning in Bali. This is years and years ago. Uh, and this bloke comes up to you and he, he opens up this really old suitcase and it's full of watches. It's got his name written in there. His name was Harry Butler. Uh, I didn't pronounce that wrong. That's how he'd spelt it, Harry Butler. But his watches, I mean, he looked dodgy, but his watches, you know, Rolexes and Casios and Omegas and Citizens, you know, incredible display of watches. And, you know, it, it, amazing prices, you know, seven to ten bucks for these great watches. It looks great. It sounds great. <laughs> but it's all just a little bit off, isn't it? Luxury watches in a suitcase uh, on a beach by a, name who, by a man who can't spell his own name. I mean, it just doesn't feel right, does it? And it's just like this story. It just doesn't feel right. It just feels a bit off. These people are professing Yahweh's name, but they're not following him, are they? They're just doing their own thing and passing it off as a God thing. I mean, it's not the most horrible, uh, blatant moral failing that we've seen in the book of Judges, far from it. But it's no less distant from God than any of those other things. See, following God is not just saying his name and then doing as you please. Following God is living for God, doing his thing. Without a wholehearted love and desire from him, for him, that there is only wandering from him. And ultimately disaster. So the passage is a warning to all who read it, including us. Here is our danger number one. Our danger number one. It is possible to do the right thing, to appear to be all about God, but really be all about us. It's possible to appear to do the right thing, to appear to be all about God, but really be all about us and not about him at all. <laughs> it's like we saw this week. It's as, it's as hollow as waving a Bible around in front of a church in the middle of a riot. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It's what Jesus said in Matthew 15. It describes this passage, doesn't it? And could it describe us? These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. If we were to line up your behaviour on a Sunday with a Monday afternoon, would it, would it match? <laughs> what about your Friday or your Saturday evening? Does the way you conduct your business line up with your talk at Bible study? Do your online habits meet with your prayers? Uh, when you're talking with your friends at school, does that meet with the way you talk to one another at church? When you talk application at Bible study, are you giving uh, the right answers 
or the real answers that show where you're really at? Are you saying the right stuff but doing your own thing? Is your outward life pointing in one direction but your heart pointing in another? See, it's a subtle trap, isn't it? It, it looks good. It looks right. But it winds us up in a really dangerous place, as we're going to see soon. But for now, we meet our next character. We meet the next guy, the Levite from Judah, a really pious-sounding guy. But just like Micah, there is something off about this bloke. Look at uh, verse 7 to 12 of chapter 17. A young Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, who had been living within the clan of Judah, left that town in search of some other place to stay. On his way, he came to Micah's house in the hill country of Ephraim. Micah asked him, where are you from? I'm a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, he said, and I'm looking for a place to stay. Then Micah said to him, live with me and be my father and priest, and I'll give you 10 shekels of silver a year, your clothes and your food. So the Levite agreed to live with him, and the young man was to him like one of his sons. Then Micah installed the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in his house. Uh, if you read it quick, it, it actually doesn't seem that bad, does it? It doesn't seem that strange until you stop and think it through. And you remember that the Levites were a bit like ministers in the time of Israel. You know, they were, they were meant to serve the people. They were meant to serve in the synagogue, to lead the people and to teach the people and to help the people know God and be close to God. For their service, Israel looked after the Levites. They gave them places to live. They gave them homes. Uh, they gave them respect and a wage, everything they needed. They were well looked after. But this Levite is, is restless. He's not staying and serving. He's moving about, not thinking about service clearly, but thinking about himself and finding a place that suits and works for him. Uh, he's supposed to be a leader in faithfulness. And yet when Micah offers him a place of his own, serving in a pagan shrine, he takes it. Uh, we, we get this picture of him being corrupted. Micah says, come and be my father, that is, lead me. But in the end, he turns out to be a bit more like Micah's sons. That is, he gets shaped by Micah. So whether he was right at the start, he certainly ends up in this pagan place. But worse than that, he's clearly in it for himself. As we read in the next chapter, when the tribe of Dan comes along, uh, they offer him a promotion. You know, why would you be priest of a family when you can be priest of a whole uh, clan? And he jumps at it. <laughs> This, this servant of God, this servant of God's people is really all about serving himself. And there's a lot of that going around, isn't there? I mean, did you see what Micah says at the end of chapter 17? Look at verse 13. And Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me, since this Levite has become my priest. What an incredible thing to say. Now God's going to make me rich. I mean, that's literally what it says. He's going to prosper me. Because not only do I have this great, expensive God shrine, but now I've got a God man to work it with me or for me. <laughs> this could only end well, he thinks. But what he actually shows us is that when we wander from God, we inevitably, unavoidably wind up serving ourselves. See, ap apart from following God apart from walking in his path is selfishness. It, it, it's innate to us. That's where we will always wind up. I mean, I, I think we've seen it this past week in America, haven't we? We've, we've seen these huge protests that, that started out peaceful, that started out, you know, so justifiable, protesting the, the innate r racism and police brutality. Um, Peaceful protests, well conducted, calling out some really terrible things. But, but what's happened as that's gone on? Well, people have taken this great cause and taken this uh, really important thing and, and twisted it to their own advantage, haven't they? they? They've seen the chaos. They've seen the disorder in the streets. They've seen the, the anonymity of a huge crowd. What do they do? Well, they think, no one's going to find me. I, I can smash that window. I can take what I like. 
And we've seen it everywhere, haven't we? Looting and stealing and violence. So what it's showing us is, given the opportunity, even the slightest chance, people are selfish. I can get the most out of this. Me. And it's true when we come to God too. See, when we wander, when we drift from him, we, we find something else to focus ourselves on. And what that is, is us. Now, sometimes we'll continue to use his name or, or use him even, but still use him for our advantage, for our gain. And so the question this story forces us to ask of ourselves and for all readers to ask is, do you live for God or do you live to use him? See, here is danger number two. Danger number two, that we would wind up living not for God, but living to use him for our own ends. Danger number two, we would wind up living not for God, but living to use him for our own ends. How easy it is to be selfish, but cover ourselves over with a veneer of God. It's, it's like that old school friend who gets in touch with you out of the blue via social media. You know, all friendly, all chummy, wanting to know what you're doing uh, and then wanting to sell you a place in their pyramid scheme. You know, we can do the same to God, can't we? Use his name. Use his place even. Use things of him to serve ourselves. We can see it terribly in the church sometimes of all places. People being more concerned with you know, having things comfortable, having things my way or the right way or how I like them or how it should be done. And so often it doesn't come back to actually good godly uh, motives driven by his word. It comes back to selfish things. We do it personally, don't we? Unconsciously, we echo Micah's words. You know, now I know the Lord will prosper me because I'm doing the right thing. Now, probably you've never said it quite so blatantly, but we act it out, don't we? Oh, God's going to do good things for me because I'm doing good things for him. Actually, sometimes the best way to discern that in our own lives is to flip it on its head. You know, the, the, to see how we react when something bad happens in our life. And we find ourselves asking, did I do something wrong? Because what that's suggesting is you're thinking of God as this personal get-ahead-in-life machine. You know, put the right deeds in, get good things out. And therefore, if you're getting bad things out, you must have put the wrong things in. But who then are you serving? Who's it about? Is it really about God? Or is it just about you? See, when we wander from God, we wind up in self. Using him rather than living for him. It's dangerous. And inevitably, it is disastrous. Now, finally, we meet our third uh, character, or our third group of characters, the tribe of Dan. Uh, if you've got a great memory and can remember back about 12 weeks, I think it is, you might remember Judges 1, uh, the, the, the list of the nations as they came in and conquered uh, the land. And we saw that got worse and worse and worse for every tribe that was listed. And the very last one was the tribe of Dan. Dan couldn't take possession of the land that had been promised. They couldn't dislodge the Amorites from their inheritance. In fact, what happened is they themselves got pushed back. And so what we're seeing here is the, the result of that, the consequences of that. The Danites are still landless. They don't have an inheritance of their own. And they're searching for a place to live. Look at chapter 18, verse 1 and 2. In those days Israel had no king. And in those days the tribe of Dan the Danites was seeking a place of their own where they might settle because they had not yet come into an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. So the Danites sent five warriors from Zorah and Eshtal to spy out the land and explore it. 
these men represented all their clans. They told them, go explore the land. The men entered the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah where they spent the night. So what we see happening is rather than the Danites trusting God uh, and taking hold of what he had promised them, the the land he'd uh, promised as their inheritance, they say, that's too hard. We don't think God can do that. We're going elsewhere. We're going to find greener pastures. And so instead of heading southwest where their land was promised, they go as far north as they possibly can to the very boundary of the promised land and even just beyond it. And as we read, they find there a rich town, the town of Laish. Uh, It's prosperous, it's unprotected, it is ripe for the plucking. And so they gather to take it. The the five men go back, inspire the people in this weird parody of the, the original conquest of the land of Israel, and then they journey off together. On their way, they find this priest whom they've apparently known before, and they take him too. They, uh, they don't fight for him, but they stand outside his house and 600 armed men standing there sends a pretty clear message. And then off they go, carrying their God with them. Surely, surely this is going to succeed. Micah, of course, is understandably angry. You know, the silver he originally stole has now been stolen from him. There's some irony for you. And so he comes chasing after it. Look at verse 23 of chapter 18. As they shouted after them, the Danites turned and said to Micah, what's the matter with you that you called out your men to fight? He replied, you took the gods I made and my priest and went away. What else do I have? How can you ask what's the matter with you? The Danites answered, don't argue with us or some hot tempered men will attack you and you and your family will lose your lives. So the Danites went their way and Micah, seeing that they were too strong for him, turned around and went back home. Don't miss the irony there, the the dripping irony in in what Micah said. You took the God I made. (laughs) You didn't take God. You took the God I made, my God, you know, the one who was supposed to help me out. I mean, it's it's totally crazy, isn't it? It's, it's, It's as silly as a spaghetti husband, a spaghetti vegetable husband. I mean, what good is a God that you make? can't do anything for you. How's that going to help you? But clearly Micah thinks it will. And clearly Dan thinks it will too. I mean, what's what's Micah going to do about it? He's got 600 soldiers standing against him. So Micah, the original thief, turns uh, back and the Danites go on. Look at verse 27. Then they took what Micah had made and his priests and went on to Laish against a peaceful and unsuspecting people. They attacked them with a sword and burned down their city. There was no one to rescue them because they lived a long way from Sidon and had no relationship with anyone else. The city was in a valley near Beth Rehob. The Danites rebuilt the city and settled there. They named it Dan after their forefather Dan, who was born to Israel, though the city used to be called Laish. There the Danites set up for themselves the idols, And Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his sons were priests for the tribe of Dan until the time of the captivity of the land. They continued to use the idols Micah had made all the time the house of God was in Shiloh. The Danites find their land uh, and they take their land. They defeat, they destroy Laish. And in a weird twist, we're actually made to pity the people there. You know, undefended, alone, peaceful. But the Danites brutally take it, destroy it, and it becomes their capital. And imaginatively, they name it Dan. But then we learn two really horrific details. The the editor includes two things to to really pick out the, the eyes of this for us. Firstly, we learn who this mysterious Levite was. We get his name. His name is Jonathan. And what's more, he's the son of Gershom, the son of Moses. Now, it's true that the the word son can mean descendant, that there might be a generational gap here. But I don't think that's why it's there. I think it's literally here and as it is written. 
This is not, you know, hundreds of years that have elapsed between the settlement of the land, between Moses' own life and these events. This is two generations, you know, 60, 70 years at best. In just such a short time, even Moses, you know, the most famous leader of Israel, even his line and his descendants are corrupted. But secondly, we're told just how badly this ends. Did you see the note there right at the very end? There's this lineage of idolatry that's set up by Jonathan and his sons and they continue to, to, to worship in this pagan, idolatrous way for hundreds of years. All the while God's house and God's place is set up for them at Shiloh. That's the place they should have been going to worship and to offer to God. It was just right there. But they do their own thing instead. For all that time, all the way until the captivity of the land, that is, it's destruction. The implication is the destruction that came from these events. See, what the narrator is telling us, what the writer of this story is telling us is, going your own way, doing your own thing, instead of going the maker's way, ends terribly. It's something uh, I found out the first time I ever put Ikea flat pack furniture together. Uh, it was early in our marriage, we bought a whole bunch of cheap Ikea furniture because that was easy. And, and foolishly I figured, well, like it's flat pack. How hard can it be to put together? I, I don't need instructions to do that. <laughs> How hard could it be? Uh, the answer is hard. <laughs> Uh, if uh, after making something that looks nothing like the picture or nothing like what we'd ordered, uh, I admitted defeat. Um, if you ever ever built IKEA for yourself, you know that doing it your own way, going your own way, it just ends really badly. It's frustrating and painful and disastrous. And so it is here. Everyone did as he saw fit in his own eyes, and it doesn't work. It ends bad. The people are no longer close to God, but even more, no longer they're close to the good life that he had promised them. This ends in complete disaster. Micah doesn't prosper as he desired. He, he loses out. The Levite who sought a name for himself instead ends up setting up this dynasty of idolatry. The Danites seeking an easy way and seeking peace end ultimately in destruction. What it's saying is if you wander from God, if you go your own way and do your own thing, there is only one consequence. Destruction. God will not tolerate it forever. Sin leads to death. So what hope? What hope is there? I mean, if you read this carefully, you might have noticed that actually God doesn't do, at least explicitly, God doesn't do anything here. He's, he's not active at all. Lots of people use his name, but he does nothing. He doesn't even say a thing. It's the least God-involved passage out of the whole book. So what hope is there? Well, here is the one hope. Here's the one hope. And it's in that refrain. In those days, Israel had no king. It's kind of a strange hope. In those days, Israel had no king. It's a negative statement. And it sounds weird, doesn't it? Because we've actually just had a book, yeah, not of kings, but we've had a book of leaders, of judges. So, so why this emphasis on a king? What's different about a king? Well, here's one key thing. Kings last. Kings last. Judges will rule as long as they live, but as we've seen, then they die and that's it. But kings, kings keep going, don't they? And not because they live forever, that's not how kings work, but because kings set up dynasties. They rule and then their son rules and then his son rules and so on and so forth. And so there's always a king. I mean, that's what God promised to the, the, the first great king, to King David. He said, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. See, there's stability in a king. 
the stability that's really lacking in Israel. There's rule in a king that doesn't come and go, but endures. And see, here's the thing. The king that God was going to bring them, the king was supposed to lead his people to God. When we, when we go back to the law, as we see it in Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, it talks about the king and it says the very first job of the king is not to you know, establish his courts and establish his army and all those things. The very first thing a king was supposed to do was write a copy of the law down for himself. Word by word, copy it out, his own personal copy, so that he knows it. He was instructed to read it every day, to learn it, in order to lead his people in it. See, what the king was supposed to do was bring his people close to God by being himself close to God. He wasn't just to lead the people. He was to lead the people for God and lead the people to God. That's why we need a king. Now, if you know the story, you know kings were to come in Israel's history. But those kings were just men. The good ones did a lot of bad things. The bad ones did a lot of really awful things. And instead of leading the people closer to God, most of them took them far further from God than they'd ever been. So is a king a hope? Well, no, not at all. But the king is. The king is the hope that's needed. And in all those kings that came, God was preparing his people for the coming of the king. Not just a human ruler, but the ruler of all. His son. Jesus. Jesus is the king who rules. He knows the law because he wrote it originally. He keeps the law because he's perfect. He rules forever, not through his children, but because he lives forever, having conquered death. And he leads his people close to God in a way that no earthly king ever could. The wandering, he returns. The selfish, those who've gone far from God, he restores. That gap, that enormous chasm that our sin created between us and God, he closes it. He demolishes it in his death and he brings his people close forever to be citizens of his kingdom for eternity. See, you will never turn your path back to God alone. You will never beat your selfishness nor change your heart and restore yourself to him. And there is no hope in trying. It's impossible. But there is hope in Jesus. For in him God forgives. In him God restores. In him God makes you new. For he is your king. If you trust in him. And the king, your king, calls you to follow him. To love him and desire him and seek for him. See, every character in this story was looking for something, weren't they? The Danites, they wanted peace. The, the Micah, he wanted prosperity. The Levite, he wanted prestige. They're things we can relate to. They're, they're things that we want too. And do you know what the irony is? Each of them in their wandering from God looked in exactly the wrong place. Because the truth is, seek for those things apart from God, you'll find none of them, only destruction. But seek them in God and you'll find not only them, but more importantly, him too, in his glorious, gracious perfection. Don't do your own thing, it won't work. Do God's thing, follow him, give your life to him wholeheartedly, joyfully. And closely because at the end of the day Jesus is the king of your castle and that's good in fact that's best for he's the king who saves from destruction he's the king who heals and brings restoration he's the king who blesses and gives his abundance most of the kids would know Colin Buchanan's song where we sung it for a performance a few years ago 
I am not the boss. You are not the boss. They are not the boss. Jesus is the boss because Jesus is the mighty, mighty king. <laughs> Sorry, I won't sing it for you. You can sing it for yourselves. He is the king. So follow the king and live for the king. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you knew exactly what we needed. We needed the king to rule us and lead us and restore us. And in your grace, you've sent him to us, not to condemn us, but to rescue us. Father, we confess we're not good at following him. We're so quick to wander. We're so quick to do our own thing, uh, to dress ourselves up in a veneer of Christianity, but really just seek ourself. Father, please forgive us and help us to, lead, uh, to, to follow you, to obey you, and even to delight in it. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness that is ours in him. And in his name we pray. Amen.